Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Upshaw, Chair of the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology Board of Directors. Welcome to our live cast event here today. Thank you for joining us. I want to acknowledge in my opening remarks uh, that the CSF offices are located on the traditional territory of the Algonquin people. We pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians uh, of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains uh, unceded. The purpose of today's event, of course, is to introduce Canada's first 24-hour movement guidelines for adults age six, 18 to 64, sorry, and adults 65 years of age and older. We'll hear from our partners on the project, then from Dr. Robert Ross, chairperson of the guidelines consensus panel, and Dr. Jennifer Tomasone, knowledge translation lead and advisory committee chairperson, who steered the development of the first public facing materials to support uh, these very guidelines. After they conclude, there will be ample opportunity for uh, Dr. Ross and Dr. Tomasone to answer your questions. So please take advantage of the link at the top right hand of your screen. Uh, enter, that, enter your questions into the chat and they'll be happy to address those questions, hopefully today, but if not, at a later time. Uh, an undertaking of this magnitude, of course, could not have occurred without the value support from our partners who have provided funding, personnel, and in-kind support. To name a few, Queen's University, participation, along with many other stakeholders and volunteers who are involved in the process. We offer a, sin a sincere thank you. Uh, we want to make special mention to Public Health Agency of Canada for their financial support for this important project. We also have a quote from the Public Health Agency of Canada, which they graciously provided us, which states the Public Health Agency of Canada would like to congratulate CSEP on the release of this new 24-hour movement guidelines. So thank you uh, for that. We'll now take a moment to hear from Elio Antunes, uh, President and CEO of, Partic of Participation, a key strategic partner. Over to you, Elio. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for tuning in today. Uh, Participation is a very proud to be part of this great team of organizations, researchers, and stakeholders that have developed Canada's first ever 24-hour movement guideline for adults. These guidelines could not come at a better time. COVID-19 has impacted individuals and their families in critical ways. Evidence indicates that Canadians are much more sedentary and less active than before the pandemic began. Mental health and the lack of social connectivity is impacting the vast majority as we abide by public health guidelines. Now more than ever, Canadians need to take advantage of the many benefits that come from being physically active, less sedentary, and having adequate sleep. Participation will work to position these guidelines as an important foundation to our overall health and well being. In fact, today's launch is really only the beginning of the journey for these guidelines because now we have to support Canadian adults to follow these recommendations and enjoy all the benefits that they can offer. From our perspective, as an organization that highlights how everything gets better when you get active, we love how the core guideline concepts work together to make your whole day matter. And we appreciate the emphasis on how some activity and movement is always better than none. The routine activities of daily living, living such as walking, gardening, household chores, and taking the stairs instead of the elevator can all contribute towards a healthy 24 hours. These are important messages that Canadians need to hear now more than ever. We look forward to working in partnership to make sure they hear it. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Back to you, Adam. Elio, thank you very much. Uh, very wise words uh, that everyone needs to hear. Thank you. I'd now like to acknowledge our two keynote speakers, which is very exciting uh, here today. Dr. Robert Ross, 24-hour movement guidelines consensus panel chair and faculty member at Queen's University, who will speak first, uh, followed by Dr. Jennifer Tomasone, knowledge translation lead, also from Queen's University. Dr. Ross, the floor is yours. Over to you. Dr. Rapsha, what a what an exciting day this is. But uh, before I begin, I too would like to acknowledge uh, that Queen's University is situated on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishabi peoples. This land has been and is still the home to many Indigenous nations. We are grateful to be guests and have the opportunity to live and present in their territory. We are committed to reconciliation and supporting the human rights of Indigenous persons. Um, to everyone. This is uh, such an exciting day, uh, not only for myself and those who will speak to you today, but for the, all of the uh, many people who have worked hard over the last three years 
uh, to help us uh, launch what we will uh, launch today in the form of 24-hour movement uh, guidelines. Welcome to all of you that are in virtual space. Uh, my understanding is that there were over 1,200 registrants as of uh, late last week, 200 of which uh, resided, uh, reside outside of Canada. So uh, a special welcome uh, uh, to those uh, who are uh, attending. As this year turned the corner, uh, we started to envision, or at least I started to envision what the official launch uh, would look like, uh, that it would be a face-to-face -face event, a symposium perhaps at the, at the society's uh, annual general meeting, that there would be balloons, there would be bunting, there would be flyovers and hugs and uh, handshakes and perhaps some special beverages. Well, COVID-19 uh, had other ideas. Uh, so here we are, uh, myself in one place, Dr. Tomasoni and another, and the organizers in uh, yet another, all coming to you uh, virtually. I'm speaking to a white dot on uh, my computer, and if at any point my white dot uh, turns black, well, you will all be witness to a, a major coronary event. Uh, uh, given that it is a, a virtual uh, uh, event, uh, we will have some uh, transitions back and forth between uh, speakers. Within the next uh, minute or so, uh, I will disappear from your uh, screen and I will transition to my own slide deck using Zoom so that I can present the, uh, the guidelines to you. we uh, uh, here today, as I said, a, a very uh, exciting day, uh, which is not the end step in our process of guideline development and dissemination, but it surely is uh, an important uh, step. So what is all the uh, fuss about? Uh, for the first time, uh, you see them, and in fact, it's a world first, and we are so proud of that fact that these are the first 24-hour movement guidelines worldwide for adults aged 18 to 64 and adults aged uh, 65 years or um, 20 or 25 uh, minutes or so. Uh, I will uh, uh, provide you some of the highlights of uh, these guidelines. Of course, I will not be able to get into the, as we say, the, the rationale or the weeds behind the uh, recommendations. Uh, but I will be providing to you uh, the uh, place where you can do exactly that to find the information that you need. So these 24-hour guidelines, we're also very proud to confirm, as many of you know, that this completes the, the family of 24-hour movement guidelines for us. Under the leadership of uh, Dr. Mark Tremblay from CHEO, in 2016 and 2017, movement guidelines uh, for children and youth, and the early years uh, were launched. And again, this was under the stewardship of uh, CSEP. And so today, as I say, uh, we launched two guidelines uh, that complete the family of 24-hour guidelines throughout the lifespan. So we're, uh, we're very excited uh, about that. Something else today that's uh, very important. As I said, of course, I, I will not be able to get into the rationale and the details of and how we arrived at all of the recommendations that I will share with you. Uh, but fear not. Uh, uh, today, also launched within the Applied Physiology and Nutrition Metabolism Journal, our home journal, of course, is a series of papers that will give you all the information that you need to know to know how did we come to the guidelines that I will share with you today in detail? And that will be uh, presented uh, to you within the principal uh, guideline development paper. We have systematic reviews, and these systematic reviews were performed by outstanding scholars. And they each have their systematic reviews published, of course, uh, within this journal. We have a special methodology uh, review uh, authored by Dr. Koh from McMaster on overviews of reviews. And then as Dr. Tomasoni will share with you a little bit later on, uh, the fundamental material that underpins the, um, she will share uh, with you today. 
and, and a special thanks uh, to Dr. Christine Fredreich from uh, the University of Calgary. As many of you know, being the guest editor of a major initiative is never an easy task. Uh, you receive a lot of uh, manuscripts at the same time, and you must uh, seek reviewers and, and uh, get those reviews back on time. That's not an easy task any day. Well, Dr. Friedenreich was uh, served up with COVID-19, which made her task all the more uh, difficult. Uh, but so she did. Uh, she was remarkable in making sure that um, all the uh, you would expect that they would be revised as you would expect and re-revised in uh, some cases. So thank you very much, Dr. Friedenreich, for acting as the guest editor. We are uh, definitely grateful for your contribution. The systematic reviews you can find published within uh, the APNM journal here, I believe at some time today, uh, you will be able to get access to those papers. Of course, they are open access, so everybody, regardless of where you live, can get them free of charge. But what we've also done is asked all of the uh, authors of the systematic reviews to uh, create a presentation that would summarize uh, their review and their findings in a way that uh, uh, we hope is uh, understandable to anybody who would access them. And I provide you here the link that you can access those systematic reviews presented to you in the form of a lecture, a PowerPoint lecture authored by the authors of the systematic reviews. So you have the papers that you need and you have the author's interpretation uh, here if you can benefit from that. And of course, you will have the coordinates of the individual authors if you want to uh, seek them out uh, for further insight. Next 10 or 15 minutes or so is basically three things. One, who is responsible uh, for generating the guidelines that we share with you today? What was the process uh, that we used? And uh, albeit, I'll, I'll bulk of my time on the guideline uh, highlights, and I will uh, factor in as much as I can the implications that the consensus panel believes are important, the most important implications for those. How? Uh, if you are leading any initiative and it is of, of value and is complex, uh, that you best surround yourself with uh, good people. Did uh, hard, but some people work uh, hard. And to express uh, to uh, those in attendance today at the quality of all of those identified here. Uh, Technology experts, Dr. Cole and Dr. Poitra, they, they couldn't have been more gracious with their time uh, with me. When we're, you're using uh, agree to or grade, uh, these are tools uh, that have firm and comprehensive procedures. And they were so gracious with the time uh, that they gave to me and I, I thank them. Our, our leads are identified to you here and again, uh, you will uh, meet Dr. Tomasoni uh, uh, following my time uh, with you. Uh, we're exemplary uh, in their our work. A special thanks to Dr. Tremblay. As I said, uh, Dr. Tremblay uh, chaired the 24-hour move guide, uh, movement guidelines that were released prior to today's uh, guidelines. And I can't tell you the number of times that uh, uh, Dr. Tremblay uh, was gracious again with his time and mentored me throughout the process. My job was very easy. Dr. Tremblay and colleagues had created the template and really all I had to do uh, was uh, follow it. So a great thank you to uh, these colleagues who were so instrumental in the guideline development process. But we weren't working uh, alone. One of the first jobs of the steering committee was to uh, uh, select, uh, to ask uh, for volunteers that would make up the consensus panel. And I show you uh, these members here to you. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the time to uh, comment on uh, the contributions that each of them uh, made. 
again, they were so gracious uh, with their time and their advice and participated in so many thoughtful discussions. But I to recognize uh, the uh, outstanding work of uh, the CSEP Executive Director, uh, Mary Duggan. I've had the opportunity to work with uh, Mary uh, for many uh, uh, decades and instrumental in being really the conduit between uh, the CSEP Board of Directors and the consensus panel. Uh, there's often questions and uh, decisions that need to be made. Uh, Mary took that information and uh, championed uh, what we were doing and for your contribution. I know I speak for the entire consensus panel when we express our gratitude at uh, this point. Uh, one of the very first hires, the first hire uh, uh, that we made was the project uh, coordinator, uh, Ms. Stephanie Flood, uh, pictured uh, here. Uh, for the last two and a half years, uh, uh, Stephanie has been absolutely outstanding in, uh, in her performance as the project coordinator. In short, she uh, brought excellence, and not only excellence and administrative skill, but indeed grace. Much indebted to uh, Stephanie for really being the glue and making sure uh, that we did everything when we were supposed to. So thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. Well, now you need money. Uh, just in uh, one cartoon here, uh, I want to acknowledge, as Dr. Upshaw did, uh, uh, the four uh, institution or constituencies uh, that were uh, fundamental to our being able to do these guys. They provided indirect uh, support uh, of the guidelines. Not only have they championed the guideline development for many decades through their stewardship, they provided uh, real dollars for this. Uh, I thank, acknowledge uh, Dr. Barbara Crow, the Dean of Faculty of Arts and Science, who showed uh, great support uh, for an initiative that was in its very early days uh, when I approached her uh, for financial support and they were very uh, gracious. Participation, as you heard uh, uh, from uh, Elio, also has played a, a vital role, both uh, directly and indirectly, and we simply would not be here without their contribution, and I'm sure you'll hear more from Dr. Tomasoni later. But to thank the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, they have many demands on the small pool of funds that they have, and they have a thorough process uh, that they put you through uh, to make sure you're worthy of those funds. Well, as they have in the past, uh, they thought our application worthy they supported the guidelines, and these guidelines simply would not be here today if it wasn't for the generosity of the Public Health Agency. People and the money, you need a process. And it's somewhat underwhelming to share with you in a single slide what has taken us two and a half years, almost three years uh, uh, to do. But a, a few uh, key uh, points. As, as uh, those of you that are uh, familiar with guideline development, you would hope that we use the uh, uh, agree to uh, tool uh, to guide uh, the process that we use for guideline development. Uh, this has been a, a fundamental aspect of uh, physical activity and now 24 hour movement guideline development in Canada. And so too, it was our, our guide, it provided our guidance uh, for our uh, consensus uh, uh, panel. Of course, we used, as uh, again, you might expect grade to go from evidence to uh, decision. Uh, there's many, many steps in that process, and I, I can tell you that we followed them all. So we followed a procedure that's robust. It's and I trust that when you read our primary process paper, uh, you will come to the conclusion uh, that the consensus panel, that we've done this the right way, and that we'll stand by uh, the recommendations uh, that we make that are part of our guidelines. Uh, uh, them, uh, uh, themselves. So a few 
uh, first time observations uh, that are uh, worth noting uh, within the guidelines. Within the guidelines, we have the first recognition ever of the health benefits associated with light physical activity. We first ever recommendations for sedentary behavior, specifically with respect to total and recreational screen time. Within the recommendation for moderate to vigorous physical activity, we remove the requirement that the bouts of moderate to vigorous physical activity be performed. Recommendations or guidelines at all from any society for sleep duration and equality. So indeed, these are all first. And another first is that the observation within these guidelines that indeed the composition of movement behaviors between sleep, sedentary, and physical act, sedentary behavior and physical activity across the entire 24 hour day is associated with health. This is really a fundamental observation and one I want to share with you because I think it provides to you what really distinguishes 24 move, hour uh, movement guidelines uh, from uh, other. Principal assertion, again, of the 24 hour uh, movement guidelines is what I would, I would like to share with you here. So have normally focused on moderate to vigorous physical activity shown to you here. Here's in isolation. In an example might be 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity is achieved, but that's achieved in association with 11 hours of sedentary time. However, are very different. COVID 24 hour day, but that if you increase one or decrease the other together, they will influence health. One more cartoon to bring this uh, point home because I think it's so important. So here's our 24 uh, hour day depicting to you arbitrarily uh, the pieces of the pie, the pieces of the 24 hour day for light physical activity, moderate sleep and sit. Uh, cartoon here. <laughs> Sedentary, just for an example, together they interact to improve. Uh, it's certainly a, a complex issue to uh, get across, but it really distinguishes it. The evidence to say that the whole day uh, matters. And uh, here I alert you to the really the tour de force systematic review authored by Ian Jansen who provides uh, the detail on how these an analyses are done, but they are really the underpinnings of a 24-hour uh, movement guideline. And that's why I wanted to share it uh, with you. Uh, this is why or how the evidence that we use to come to the conclusion that the whole day uh, matters, that you move more, reduce sedentary time and sleep well, that these interact together. That's the point that we want uh, to make. And we think the implications here that we speak to individual Canadians. In other words, it's not one size fits all. There are many options uh, provided in the guidelines in a way that reflect and respect the individuality of the person, the variability, the ability or the unwillingness to uh, perhaps participate in moderate to vigorous physical activity while they have options. Their personal preferences can be recognized. So in short, the 24 hour movement guidelines provide options for Canadians and they provide counseling options for practitioners. And that's just so fantastic. It's just so fantastic that the 24 hour movement guidelines provide those unique and novel opportunities 
uh, uh, for all of us who are our practitioners. So to the recommendations, so my format for the next uh, four or five slides, and I will end there, is just to provide the individual recognition, uh, re recommendation, excuse me, for moderate to vigorous physical uh, activity as I'm doing here, and then provide the uh, references below uh, that you can access to uh, access the rationale for these recommendations. So the recommendation for moderate to vigorous physical activity is, is to accumulate at least 150 minutes per week. That has not changed. There's no evidence uh, uh, since the uh, um, publication of our last physical activity guidelines in 2011 that says that should change. However, there is evidence that we no longer uh, require that that MVPA be required in 10 minute bouts. And again, I think that opens more opportunities to uh, achieve uh, that guideline for uh, Canadians. Uh, the muscle strengthening activities so using major uh, muscle groups again twice a week is no change from the last uh, uh, guideline. And for, uh, for our uh, guideline for um, adults age 65 years and over, physical activities that challenge a balance, again, that is no change from the physical activity guidelines uh, last launched in 2011. For light physical activity, and this is the first uh, recommendation for this physical activity, and again, you can seek this reference for the rationale behind our recommendation. It's the first ever recommendation of the health benefits associated with this form of activity that you know is best represented by activities of um, daily living for sedentary behavior, sedentary time to be eight hours or less, uh, which includes uh, no more than three hours of recreational screen time, and also the recommendation that the sedentary time, uh, that you break up that sedentary time or long periods of sedentary time as uh, much as you possibly uh, can. Uh, slightly different for adults 18 to 64, 65 years and older, seven to nine hours of good quality uh, sleep with consistent uh, bed and wake up times, seven to eight hours of the same for adults 65 years and older. And as I conveyed earlier, these are the first ever sleep guidelines uh, for Canadian uh, adults. The uh, last uh, uh, recommendation uh, is of course the 24 hour movement behavior composition that the integration of these movement behaviors interact uh, to improve um, uh, one's health. This simple observation has led to really two very important recommendations in the guidelines. The first is that for health benefits, adults should be active each day, minimize behavior and, and achieve sufficient uh, sleep. Other matters, in this case, sedentary behavior with additional physical activity or trading light physical activity with more moderate to vigorous physical activity can present even greater health benefits. These are our unique recommendations to 24 hour uh, movement. Uh, gotten observation, but one that's indeed very important. It's in the guidelines for Canadian adults to achieve. They don't have to be achieved for health benefits. Any of the targets will achieve some health benefit or threshold for health benefit. And I think that's a very important, this is not a unique observation. This has been true of physical activity guidelines in the past. And it's certainly true of 24 hour movement guidelines. So some activity is better than none is a take home message that we wanna make sure all Canadian practitioners and Canadian adults understand. We think are many, I share with you only three uh, here. The risk of lifestyle-based disease for all Canadian adults is truly a, a unique opportunity to these movement uh, behavior uh, guidelines. How are many Canadians who cannot meet a single guideline recommendation? It's 
Okay. Again, there are many options within the guidelines that the individual Canadian could choose on any given day. And any given day can be different depending on the uh, abilities or the willingness of the individual. Changing in movement behaviors in a way that reflect and respect the individuality and personal preference, I think is something that is inherent to these guidelines. And it's a message that we certainly want to promote. messages. There are uh, but two at this point. Activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep interact to promote and protect the health of adults. Should use the 24-hour movement guidelines to counsel their patients on how to enhance health, improve quality of life, and thereby reduce the risk of lifestyle-based disease. And, and use it now uh, by way of introduction to uh, Dr. Tomasoni. What I did not show you at the beginning was uh, this arrow here. Right at the first consensus panel meeting, our very first meeting is a consensus panel, the consensus panel recognized unanimously the importance of knowledge translation, dissemination, and implementation. The importance of it, we noted that it should begin immediately, that it should happen in parallel with the development process. And this knowledge translation process itself was a science, that it requires expertise and specific skills. To translation process is in place to Beginning, uh, we charged uh, Dr. Jennifer Tomasoni with exactly that. She was given the charge to put together a knowledge advisory, a knowledge translation, excuse me, advisory committee to develop the processes that would be used to disseminate and implement these guidelines and indeed create the first ever public facing documents. We recognized that this was a large task. This was a, a major effort we were asking Dr. Tomasoni to pursue. Skill and grace to that position. And I'm very much looking forward uh, to Dr. Tomasoni sharing uh, with you the highlights of the process that her and her knowledge advisory team. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Ross, for the introduction and your incredibly kind words. It's convenient that the audience cannot see me right now because I am blushing. Um, on behalf of the consensus panel, I want to extend our sincere gratitude for your persistent efforts with the guideline development process over the past three years. Your impeccable leadership and dedication to this work has gotten us to today's launch, so thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for celebrating with us today. On behalf of the larger knowledge translation team, I am truly honored to be here to talk about our public facing materials. For the first time in Canadian 24 hour movement guideline history, we have produced an evidence based suite of public facing materials to accompany the scientific guideline documents. I am excited to share how we arrived at these materials, how we envision they can be used and where you can access them. As Dr. Ross mentioned, when the consensus panel first came together nearly two years ago now, we talked about how useful physical activity and movement behavior guidelines are for Canada. We have used them to set behavioral benchmarks, develop our public health messages, and uh, engage in population level surveillance. However, despite their availability and the efforts that have gone into branding and iconography and mass media campaigns, we're seeing a consistent gap. Canadians are not aware of the guidelines and behavioral targets remain unmet. In fact, we see less than 13% of Canadians being aware of our previous guidelines and less than 16% of Canadian adults meeting our previous physical activity recommendations. Now this gap is not unique to Canada. 
other countries have also expressed a similar concern for their physical activity and movement guidelines. And so to bring knowledge and practice closer together, we turn to the scientific discipline of knowledge translation or KT. KT has an ultimate goal of enhancing the health of populations by getting high quality research evidence used in practice. In our case, we wanted our high quality evidence-based guidelines to be able to be used by all Canadians. We not only wanted Canadians to be aware of them, but to take steps towards meeting them. So to reap the many benefits that Dr. Ross has highlighted for us. Now, focusing on knowledge translation from the beginning of the guideline development process was also a first for Canadian movement guideline history. And we were very proud that it was funded, planned and researched we had to get it right. And so we turned to a well-known knowledge translation framework, Graham and colleagues' knowledge to action framework. We operationalized this framework for our purposes and used it as our blueprint for the many steps and research studies we would undertake to help inform our work. I know this is hard for you to see, but I just put it up here to show you that we were systematic and rigorous in our process. And you're welcome to read more about the details in the Applied Physiology, Nutrition and Metabolism special issue, which was published today. I'm back. In, in order for us to engage in this systematic and rigorous process, we wanted to do it in, in an integrated knowledge translation or an IKT fashion. In IKT, guideline researchers and knowledge users work together at all stages in order to produce findings that are more relevant and actionable and thus have an increased chance of getting used in policy and practice. So we had to establish a team that would lead this charge. We started off by establishing a KT steering committee, which brought together researchers and individuals from the main funders and drivers of dissemination of the guidelines. This group of individuals has met monthly over the past two years, and in fact has met weekly in the months leading up to today to provide strategic direction and oversight of the knowledge translation process. We also established a broader KT advisory committee this group represents individuals from all across the country, from various sectors with different expertise. This group has attended webinar meetings, in-person meetings, pre-COVID of course, and responded to countless emails. They are our liaisons to other sector partners. They've shared their expertise and consulted with us, and they are committed to ongoing promotion of the guideline beyond today. We were incredibly grateful to have Dr. Melissa Browers join our team as a KT methodologist. Dr. Browers is an internationally recognized expert in guideline knowledge translation, and she has helped us ensure that our process was systematic, rigorous, evidence-based, and transparent. On this slide, you see many of the heavy lifters of the KT process. The KT process itself would not have been possible without the steadfast contributions of Stephanie Flood, our project coordinator, who coordinated both the guideline development and KT work. I'd also like to acknowledge the many trainees who led and contributed to the knowledge translation studies, which directly informed and impacted the work you're going to see today. And finally, I would like to acknowledge Frances Bevington from the US Department of Health and Human Services. As an external international consultant, we were very lucky to learn from Francis's Francis's experience disseminating the 2018 US physical activity guidelines. Francis's experience gave us a frame of reference and a vision for how we would like our public facing materials to unfold. The KT advisory committee came together in person in June, 2019. At this meeting, we discussed previous Canadian and international guideline knowledge translation efforts, and we came to a very important decision. 
Canada must do better when it comes to sharing the guidelines with members of the general public. Traditionally, CSEP has released a single guideline document for all audiences to refer. So members of the general public, health professionals, policymakers, researchers, everyone would be directed to the scientific guideline document that provides the full wording of the guidelines. The focus of these documents is the behavioral thresholds or the behavioral recommendations themselves. And of course, these behavioral thresholds are important for the reasons I stated earlier. But we know that when members of the general public see behavioral thresholds, it, they tend to be associated with more negative perceptions of the guidelines, and they can be off-putting to adults who are not sufficiently active. We know that this is the majority of our Canadian population, and that's not what we wanted Canadians to think of our new guidelines. So we envisioned public-facing materials, which could present the guideline recommendations more generally without the use of thresholds. These materials could be pitched at a reading level of grades six or seven, make use of small, simple words and descriptions, and focus on action words to keep the message clear and concise. Generic messages have the potential to highlight that health is possible at any level of engagement. And as Dr. Ross just mentioned, this is one of the key take home points of our 24 hour movement guidelines. Generic messages are also theorized to be more realistic and understandable by the general population and because of this, people are more likely to take small steps towards behavior change, which is one of our ultimate goals. But we had never done this in Canada, so we designed a series of formative research projects to help inform our work. First, in partnership with Participaction, we surveyed over 1,000 representative Canadian adults and asked them about how they like to get information about physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. They told us that they like to see practical examples and instructions of how to engage in the behavior. They told us that they would prefer generic messages over threshold messages. And they also said that they turn to diverse communication channels from social media to their family and friends, to websites and to their health professionals when they search out this information. We then surveyed nearly 900 stakeholders who might use the guidelines in their professional work. We asked them for, for comments on a draft of the guidelines and asked them their opinions on how we might message the guidelines to members of the general public. They told us that we need to break down the guidelines into simpler language and provide more practical examples of the behaviors whenever possible. They agreed that generic messages would be preferred over threshold messages, and that the idea of the whole day matters might be a convenient way to get at the notion of how these behaviors are integrated. We then experimentally tested the impact of generic and threshold messages on 250 adults' confidence to meet the behavioral recommendations. We found that repeated exposure to the messages was crucial and that generic messages were particularly important for increasing confidence among adults who were the least active. Again, we know that this is the majority of our Canadian population. So all of our research findings were packaged and shared with our KT advisory committee and our consensus panel. We asked for their feedback on how to interpret the data and how we can make use of these findings in public facing materials. Participation staff and graphic designers worked hard to take our ideas and our research findings and create a mock-up of what the public facing materials could look like. These materials were fed forward to the group once again, and through a six month long process of consultation through webinars and through emails, I am now very pleased to present you with Canada's first public facing materials for the 24 hour movement guidelines. A single poster has been developed to highlight the idea that we can all make our whole day matter. The icon of a clock has been included to encapsulate the idea that the entire 24 hour period is what we're talking about with these guidelines. You can see that there are two generic messages on the poster, make your whole day matter, as well as move more, reduce sedentary time, sleep well. Thresholds do not appear anywhere on, on this poster. The icon of the clock 
as well as the icons of the shoe, the screen, and the moon and stars appear consistently throughout our public facing materials, as do the two generic messages with the idea that repeated exposure will help these messages stick with our Canadian audience. We've also produced a series of infographics to provide more details about the guidelines. We've, we've addressed uh, one of the key findings of our work to, sit, to share the benefits of the guidelines with our audiences. So the first set of infographics, one for adults 18 to 64 years, the other for adults 65 years and older, gets at the idea of the many benefits that can come from working towards meeting the guidelines. A second set of infographics gives the behavioral thresholds, but in a more digestible format than the scientific guideline documents. And lastly, to address our research finding that Canadians want practical examples and instructions on how to do the behaviors, we've created an infographic that gives some very hands-on tips for how the behaviors integrate together and how we can make our daily routines more in line with the guidelines. Our hope is that the infographics and the poster can be shared with patients, clients, students, really anybody, family and friends, who may want to learn more about the guidelines or who may be interested in making small changes to their movement behaviors. Because our research suggested that social media now more than ever is import an important source of information for Canadian adults, we have also created a series of social media posts with associated graphics, hashtags, and links. There are two provided on the screen, but there are six in total. And we encourage you to please download and use and share on any of your social media platforms to help us increase awareness of the guidelines amongst your followers. In summary, to try to enhance awareness of the new 24 hour movement guidelines, we worked systematically and collaboratively to produce an evidence based suite of public facing materials that we believe will resonate with Canadian adults. We have packaged the materials in a way so to make it convenient for policymakers, health professionals, researchers, and anyone to be able to share these materials. We are hoping that the variety of materials will enhance how often Canadians see the key messages and aid with guideline awareness, and thus start to close that knowledge to practice gap that we see in Canada. The public facing materials are available for free download and use from both the CSEP and participation websites. Please make use of these evidence based materials in your professional work and everyday lives. The public facing materials would not have been possible without support from the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology, the Public Health Agency of Canada, Queen's University, participation, as well as the commitment, time and effort from all of those on the knowledge translation team. Thank you for listening. Dr. Ross and I look forward to your questions. Oh, well, that was outstanding. It really was. I think you've captured the essence of the hard work uh, that your uh, knowledge translation advisory team has done. This comes as no surprise to us, but I'm, I'm sure it reinforces to all those who are attending on just how much work and, and leadership you've shown in a very important part of uh, guideline development. So thank you very much for that. We do have time. We are, we are cognizant of, of the time. We will finish uh, on the hour as promised. Uh, I have downloaded some questions as we are going. Uh, we'll start with the first one. Uh, hopefully I will get it right. Uh, uh, Dr. Tomasoni, I think this one goes to you. It comes as no surprise actually. With the second wave of COVID-19 and potentially more restrictions coming, what meet the guidelines? So Dr. Ross, you cut out there, but just to confirm the question is, um, what can Canadians do to, to aim to meet the guidelines? 
Okay. Um, so when we think about how we can make our whole day matter, we have to remember that there are small steps we can take every day and throughout our day to start to see the many benefits that can come from meeting the guidelines. So there are psychological and physical benefits that we can see, even with small changes. We can experience better mood, increased energy, and a more positive outlook on life. This isn't necessarily about being complicated or expensive. There are small tweaks we can make to our daily routines. So this is about making the most of your time, not trying to add anything or to find more time. So for example, move more. How can we incorporate physical activity into our daily routines? Well, one of my favorites is um, doing a little bit of dancing while brushing my teeth or brushing my daughter's teeth. Um, or perhaps we can pace or walk around while chatting on the phone with a loved one, which we know is super important when we can't be face to face with our loved ones. The next, the next piece, reduce sedentary time. Um, is it possible for us to take some standing breaks or some stretching breaks while watching a Netflix show? Um, or can we stand during a work meeting or do some movement in our chair while we're in a work meeting? And finally, how can we sleep well? It's really important for all of us to find a relaxing screen-free bedtime routine that we start at the same time every night. So scheduling in our sleep routine into our days will help to ensure that we're getting in bed at a consistent time and hopefully an alarm is waking us up at a consistent time as well. And so it really is these small, healthy movement choices throughout our day and every day that can make a big impact over time. So I hope that was a little bit helpful. Um, and if people are interested in more tips, they can go to the participation website for further information. Well, I have a few uh, other questions here. Uh, looking at some, perhaps uh, I will take the next one. If adults uh, do not uh, follow the guidelines to the letter, uh, will there still be health impact? So may I'm understanding that I'm cutting in and out a little bit, but hopefully I think in responding to that question to make a, a point that we made uh, uh, during our brief session with you that uh, uh, all exercise matters, all physical activity matters. line for sedentary behavior, for light physical activity or moderate to figure out that physical activity is associated with benefits. There's no threshold effect. And that's, I, I think, one of the exciting ingredients within 24 hour movement guidelines. There's no isolation on one. On Canadians will be faced with challenges that might make it more difficult to one guideline uh, over others. Uh, that's okay. So as we say, we, we have options and all for all behaviors. Uh, light physical activity. If the points that Dr. Tomasoni's uh, to those audience. Appreciate that putting on casually, regardless of the elevator, walking to the store uh, and public for many years, but there's never been evidence supporting that. Is it health? And we now have that first evidence. And that's why we've come to that recommendation. We're not yet ready to, to give a certain number of hours of light physical activity, but reasons, uh, Dr. Tomasoni, that our stakeholder fee feedback uh, um, was so was constant in their observation of the feasibility of our the implementation of our, our guidelines for them. Both the practitioner and the public was saying that. And I think the light physical activity guideline 
speaks to that. So I take that opportunity to uh, to emphasize it uh, uh, here. Uh, one or two more minutes, uh, um, Dr. Tomasoni. So I'll I'll give you uh, uh, one more from those that I I have uh, here. That. Guidelines compared to others, like those established by uh, our colleagues in the United States or the World Health Organization. Thanks, Dr. Ross, and thanks for whoever asked the question. Uh, so what's unique about our guidelines is that they cover a suite of behaviors. Uh, we are starting to see physical activity guidelines released internationally that provide recommendations for both physical activity and sedentary behavior. However, ours go a step further and provide a recommendation for sleep to complete that 24 hour day or that complete clock um, to make our whole day matter. Um, we also see a distinction in our guidelines here where we've drawn a line in the sand with how much sedentary time um, is recommended, as well as how much um, recreational screen time is included with that recommendation. So that is another uh, distinction. Um, and so we are really proud of these guidelines um, being the first to really capture the idea that the whole day matters. Um, was there anything in there that I that you'd like to, to highlight, Dr. Ross? You've made the point um, uh, uh, focus generally on a single behavior and that our guidelines are a focus on an integration of behaviors, I think is the point we both tried to make uh, here uh, numerous times. To have time for any more questions because we want to uh, finish uh, on time. Um, so I'll, I will um, ask uh, you, Jen, at, uh, at this point, uh, do you have any uh, final comments that you want to share with our audience? No, other than uh, please make your whole day matter and help spread the word to those you work with and those that you love, um, that we, we all have, uh, have the opportunity to, to make our whole day matter. Uh, so I will close by uh, uh, saying once again uh, how it has been my uh, honor and privilege to work with such a remarkable group of scholars of disciplines that have worked tirelessly over the last uh, uh, two and a half years to bring you the guidelines uh, that we launch uh, here today. Uh, of course, we're very proud of our guidelines, but I'm equally as proud of the process and the people that were used uh, to develop them. All practitioners will use the 24-hour movement guidelines to counsel their patients, counsel their clients on how to enhance health, improve movement guidelines that we launch here today will allow you to do that. Uh, you will see the final screen, uh, the locations and the contact information uh, should you um, uh, want to seek further information uh, on the guidelines or seek the guidelines uh, themselves. Uh, we thank you once again. Time of COVID, uh, seem to be lacking control, take control. Have your clients take control. Follow the guidelines and improve your health. So from all of us here, we bid you good day and thank